Hello physics students! In this video, we're going to begin our next physics topic. And as in the last topic, I want to begin with a demonstration. So what I have here is a towel on the floor, and inside that towel there's also crumpled paper towel. What I'm going to do is I'm going to drop this jar onto the towel and paper arrangement. And as you... Yeah. You can see the jar withstood that fall, that impact, and did not break. Next what I'm going to do is remove the towels and repeat the experiment. Here we go. And you see the jar shattered. And the question is, why did it shatter? And some of you will say, well, because you removed the cushion. Before there was a cushion to cushion the fall, and therefore the jar did not break. And that's a fine explanation from an English language standpoint or from an everyday common experience standpoint. But we're in physics class. And what we want to do is explain that difference away with the physics that we have learned. So what I'm talking about is, you know, we learned about energy, forces, accelerations. How can we explain that smashing jar in the second instance? And it turns out that we actually do have a framework. So what I have here are a couple equations. And the first one is from the kinematics unit. In both cases, these two terms were approximately equal for the jar. When it hit the floor or the cushions, either way, the final velocity was zero. When it hit the, when it came down, it came down with approximately six meters per second. We could calculate that. So let's say this is six and this is zero. The difference between the two scenarios in this equation is right here. When we had the jar hit the towels, the distance that we allowed the jar to stop in was large. And if everything else is the same in this formula, if this is large, this can be small. Whereas when you hit the floor, there's almost no give to the floor. In other words, the distance that the jar is forced to stop in is very small. And with all these terms the same, then this has to be large to compensate. In other words, 36 subtracted to the other side, and then a tiny distance you solve for a big acceleration. And then from Newton's laws, knowing that kinematics says that we need more acceleration now to stop the jar on the floor, you can see that with more acceleration, more force is required. More force than the glass molecules can withstand, and they shatter. Okay, so once again, Newton's laws allows us to explain it all away. But there's a problem. Newton's laws, just like in the last unit, was technically enough to explain exactly how something moved down a roller coaster, for example. And you could use Newton's laws to figure out the velocity at the, or the speed at the bottom, but a tremendous calculation very complicated. So physicists devised a new way to think about the same idea, energy conservation. And with the ideas and the tools of energy, you can solve for the final speed at the bottom with a little simple algebra, get the same exact answer. So Newton's laws was really the heart of energy. And energy was just a way to get the same answer with less work. And it turns out that going forward, when you're studying collisions, as in the case of the jar, technically Newton's laws gives you all the answers that you need. But it's much too complicated often to use Newton's laws to solve and get the answers 
with Newton's laws. So physicists devised a yet another new redundant way to look at things like this collisions that gives us the answers with less heartache, less sweat, if you will, and that's what we're going to learn about in this topic. So let's begin with this new framework, these new set of ideas. So what's this new idea that allows us to analyze collisions more conveniently? The idea is momentum, and the symbol that we use for it is a lowercase p. And it's defined as the mass of an object times its velocity. So the first point I'll make about momentum is that it's a vector. In a collision, it matters whether you're, an object is getting hit from one direction or from another in terms of the outcome. So momentum has a direction that's the same direction as the velocity. The other thing is that it's measured in kilograms times meters per second, as I show here. And in the case of energy, when we had a Newton times a meter, we renamed that a joule for convenience. It turns out that there's no new unit in momentum. You, the units of momentum are just kilogram meter per second. So you have to carry all those units, even though it's not, the great, uh, not exactly convenient. And then the last thing I want to kind of explain is, well, what is momentum like conceptually? What does it mean? To give you an idea, it's basically like the effect of something that it has when it crashes into something, okay? So, uh, like for example, take a mosquito of a tiny mass, sort of buzzing very slowly, and it hits you in the arm. You're not necessarily even going to feel that because it's so little mass times so little velocity, so little momentum. But if you're hit with like a shot put that's thrown really hard, boom, it hits you in the arm. It's got much more mass, much more velocity, has more momentum, more effect in a collision. Okay, so that's kind of what it is in terms of like a feeling sense. Another thing we're going to define today, oh, so by the way, so that's the, the unit will be all in terms of momentum. How can we now analyze various scenarios using this concept of momentum? What are the things that are true for momentum of a particular object or system, that's what we're going to be learning about in this topic. To help us with that goal, we're going to also learn about impulse. Uh, the symbol for impulse is a capital J, and it's equal to the net force times the time, units being Newton seconds. Once again, there's no convenient unit to rename it, so impulses are just in Newtons per second. Impulse is also a vector. It's force, net force, which is a vector, has a direction times time, so it's itself a vector. So what is impulse? And again, in terms of like conceptually, what does it mean to supply something with an impulse? Think of it kind of like your effort that you put into something, into moving it or stopping it or whatever. So if I push on this car here with a very small F net over a very small amount of time, so I go like this, right? I put a little bit of impulse into it. And so you see the effect of my effort, not that much. If instead I go like this, as hard as I can and I push for as long as I can, this car is gonna shoot and rocket across the track and crash into the end. So you see I'm putting more effort, more force and more time. And that takes us to the next idea. What does impulse do in terms of the momentum? Impulse changes the momentum of an object. So this is actually the big idea for today right here. Impulse, what does it do? Force times time, it changes an object's momentum, okay? Now, if you're thinking that this kind of looks like Newton's laws, if I push on something, I'll give it velocity, well, because I'm giving an acceleration, then you're thinking the right thing. Again, I said this topic is redundant. This here is nothing more than a different way to state Newton's second law. So that's all this is, Newton's second law. Okay. Let me move this out of the way. I'm not sure if it's in the way of the writing. 
All right, so there's our idea. Uh, by the way, it's in the reference table. If you look at the back of the reference table here, here's one that's a little worn out from the weather, but right around here, right, so I, you can see J equals F times time, and it also equals delta P. So they, where they combine those equations all into one line like that, okay? So they just made it all string out. All right, now you know the, uh, one of the big ideas for this unit. Let me see how good you are with it. Let me ask you a question. You're driving in a car with your friend and you get to a car accident. Two cars collide head on and they're approximately the same size cars, a couple sedans or something like that. But they're different models. You know, maybe one's a Honda, one's a Ford, whatever. They're different cars about the same size. And one of the cars is completely crushed in. The hood's bent up. The bumper's caved in, the radiator fluid spilling out and the motor oil onto the road making a mess, and the other car completely intact. No damage whatsoever. How many people would look at the car that's all crushed up and look at that car and say, wow, what a great car. I'm going to go buy one of those. Not many people. I've heard people say, look at that car, survived an accident with a scratch. That's a great car. False. It's a terrible car. Let me try and explain why using what we learned. So sketch this here, best of your ability. Collisions, impulse, change in momentum, force, and time. What we have, two cases, identical cars. I just drew like Volkswagen bugs, you know, driving. One, and they're both going 60 miles an hour. And maybe the passengers are identical twins. Everything's the same, okay? And in one case, this car slams into a brick wall, indestructible, at 60 miles an hour. Case two, this car slams into a pile of hay, 60 miles an hour. And they stop, both cars. Let me ask you a question. Which of these cars experienced a greater change in momentum? A lot of people will say this one. Not true. P equals MV. Identical cars, identical mass, identical initial speeds. So they had the same momentum before. After the collisions, they both are going zero and zero. They both went to zero. Same initials, same finals, same change for both cars. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write delta P the same size for both of these cars. If one was bigger, I'd write delta P, right? But they're the same size. And I'll even write here, same. But how did they achieve that delta P? How did they change that momentum? They had different forces in different times. If you think about it, it's kind of like the glass jar. When you hit something, that does not give it all. If you had to time how long it took my hand to stop and I went like that, just like that, instantaneous, the time is tiny when you hit something that's immovable. So what I'm going to do is write a small T like this. And when you hit something soft, like the jar, hitting the towels, or hitting a hay, bay, or, or hay, hay bale, or, or a pillow, or something like that. What happens is you hit the soft surface, and you slow down, slow down, slow down, and the time is greater than when you hit something solid like that. So in this case, the car stops with more time. So I'll write a T bigger. Now, the product of force times time has to equal the change in momentum. So this side of the equation for both cars is the same, okay? So in order for that to be the case, in order with a tiny time, you need an enormous force compared to the situation where you have a long time, then your force will be small. 
That's why the hay bale or pile of hay causes less damage. Why the jar hitting the towels suffered less damage. Yes, you could say cushion if you're talking in everyday life, but in physics, what you're going to say is when you hit something that gives, the time for that collision is greater, thereby meaning less force for the same change in momentum. When you hit something that does not give, the floor, a wall, the time is tiny, stop instantly or almost instantly. To get the same change in momentum, you need bigger force, more damage. Okay, so that's the physics way we use momentum. Let's now talk about the car again. Okay, those two cars. One car crushed in, the other one no damage. So, of course, uh, engineers, you know, they're smart people. They can't sell you a car and then in the manual say, never hit a brick wall. If you're going to make an accident, make sure you hit a pile of hay, right? That's not how accidents work. You don't have a choice. You hit an ice patch, whatever, and, and it's an accident. So they know that that's no control over what you're hitting. So the only other option is to make the car itself the thing that gives. Let me show you a little demonstration. What I'm going to do is I'm going to walk toward a wall and this is going to represent the hood of my car in front of me. In one case, I'm going to let the hood crush down. In the other case, we're going to have a good car, right? Strong, solid. It won't dent, right? And we'll see the difference. So give me a second. I'll reconfigure. Okay, so I have my Beautiful file cabinet here. A student painted this for me years ago. Nikola Tesla, a, a big hero in physics and engineering. But we're going to use this to be represent our brick wall. As I said, here's my hood of my car. And in the first case, I'm going and I have, quote, the lousy car that demolishes on impact. So let's see what happens from force and time perspective. My body has a certain momentum, 60 miles an hour, whatever that is in meters per second, times my body mass. Here I come, I gotta get to zero because I'm hitting the wall. So I go 60 miles an hour, boom, hood is crushing down, crushing down, crushing down, crushing down. That took a lot of time relative to the next case and my hood now is crushed in, okay? So lousy car, no that extended the time in the collision, decreased the force in the collision on my body, and I can walk away from that accident. Car number two, the good car, the tough car, here it comes, right? It's not gonna bend at all, 60 miles an hour. Boom, right? Time is tiny, force is huge destroys my internal organs or some kind of damage, ruptures something, and that could be fatal. So yes, the, good car, the cars are good because they crush down, right? We want to survive a car accident. It, it, we don't want to go to a funeral and look at somebody who died in a car accident and say, well, at least the car survived, right? We could at least drive. No, you don't care about that. You let the car go into the junkyard and let the person live they're designed on purpose to crush down, okay? So, interesting idea. Get the car that crushes on purpose, designed that way. And I should say, they do all kinds of tricks like that. Uh, in the old days, cars were constructed, uh, we're talking like in the 70s, even in the early 80s, with an actual frame, they called it a chassis. And they were basically like two I-beams that you know, ran the length of the car and all the parts of the car bolted on. I-beams don't crush well. They got rid of that all the way back in the late 1980s, I believe, was when they first started getting rid of that. And the cars are now called unibody construction. There is no frame to them, again, so that they more conveniently crush down. And um, they even do things like some cars have the motor fall out. You say, what a terrible car. You hit something, the motor falls and cheap. No. It does that to get the motor out of the way because the motor doesn't crush. So we want that out of the way so there's more cushion room, more time, less force. 
and same with the trunk. Now obviously the part that you're in, you don't want that to crush because then it crushes and kills you. So that cage that's around your body and the passengers you want pretty solid and tough. Everything else, let it give, let it crush, let it get destroyed, save lives that way. Okay, so let's uh, reconfigure and I'll summarize on the board. Okay, so I created a list of the different scenarios uh, about the two situations that I talked about, small, uh, big time small force versus small time big force. Car crumple zones create extended time of collision, making less force. If you have a truck with a frame in it or an old car with a frame, like a pre-1980s car, those do not crush down well on impact and therefore the forces on the body in, this, in those car accidents are greater, uh, more likely to cause damage. Now related to the car crumple zones are the seatbelts and the airbags. The seatbelts keep you rooted to the car so that you slow down in that gradual, gradual fashion rather than letting the car slow down gradually and then you hit the windshield at 60 miles an hour. Well, that doesn't help. The crumple zones don't help you then. So the seatbelts and airbags achieve that. By the way, one little thing since we're talking about cars, I do want to mention a lot of people have a misconception about airbags, that they're these nice pillows that come out and you hit it, oh, it's so nice. Airbags are tremendously violent. They have explosives in them, like I don't know if it's gunpowder or what, but they basically blow outward with such force that if you're too close, they could actually kill you. That's why they, don't, they tell you not to put car seats for children in the front seat. That airbag coming off would kill the child. So, and uh, there are people I know who have um, uh, been hit by an airbag and it's, they said it feels like a sandbag hitting them like 50 miles an hour. It's like you get all bruised up. Now it's, it, it's better than hitting the dashboard and the windshield, but it's still something. Don't put things on the dash when you're driving. Don't uh, put your feet up. That's uh, a lot of people do that. When that airbag comes out, it's going to crush your legs into your body. So always be mindful that an airbag is a very violent thing, okay? It saves lives, but it's not a pillow. It's tremendous force to stop your body. So just a little side thing. Now, old days, the cars, if you look at classic cars like 1950s Cadillac or something like that, you'll see no seatbelts and metal dashboards, tremendous fatalities, all right? You're hitting that metal, no give, and it causes brain damage and kill, kills. So metal dash, the opposite of this. Another thing people don't realize, why do boxers wear gloves? People think it's so they don't hurt their fists. It's nothing to do with the fists, although that helps so not hurt your fist, but it's more about the brain. If you went into a boxing match with just your fists and you're punching the head over and over, then the blood shakes so much you can have a blood rupture and the boxing match could be fatal. So to make it a little bit more humane, I guess you could say they put the boxing glove to increase the time, decrease the force on the head. It could still be fatal but it's less likely to be fatal because of that give, which extends the time, decreases the force on the brain. Egg toss, right? You're throwing an egg. How do you catch it? You don't catch it like that, right? What you do is you catch it and you give with it, right? So that's, you extend the time to stop the egg and decrease the force so it doesn't break. And of course, the jar falling on the towel was something we saw. The opposite effect, I mentioned a couple already. Now, the opposite of boxing gloves, brass knuckles. So you may have seen these in old movies about like the mob in the 30s or whatever. Uh, I don't know, maybe they're still used, popular now. But basically, when you punch someone with your fist, you're hitting them with bone, which causes a lot of damage because the bone's very hard. But some people aren't even satisfied with that. They say the bone gives too much and makes too much time, not enough force. Let me get brass knuckles, metal knuckles, and I punch someone, make the time even smaller to make the force bigger, right? So that's the opposite effect. Related, the karate chop, when someone's, you know, studying martial arts, they want to break boards or cement blocks. How do they do that, right? Do they go like this, all right, I'm ready, Rah! right, with like a wet fish, dead fish, like that how they hit it? No, that's not going to be effective because the hand gives and does this, less force. What you do is you tighten that fist up and you hit it, and that makes the hard surface, the time small and the force big, and then the boards break, right? So that's another example, okay? And then the jar falling 
on the floor without the towel there is another example. So a bunch of examples of this inverse proportionality between force and time. One last thing that I want to mention, again, all just concepts today, is the effect of bouncing in a collision. A lot of people think that when something's bouncy, it's less effective in a collision. So let me show you what I mean by that. So, okay, so what I have here are a couple rubber spheres, and they're like, basically like little bouncy balls. One of them actually bounces, right? You see that typical bouncing effect that, you know, when you buy these little uh, balls out of the gumball machines, right? They bounce like this. The other one though is same mass, but of a different kind of rubber. And watch what it does. Oops. Dead. No bounce to it, all right? So the question is, which one of these delivers more impulse, more effect during a collision? And a lot of people will say, well, the bouncy one seems springy. The other one's dead. It like hits and thud. So I think that one delivers more impulse. And it turns out it's not true. Okay, so I have a little bit of movement here. Make these the same length. There we are. Okay, so what I have here is a block of wood and let me mark its starting point right, right here. And what I'm going to do is see which of these is more effective at knocking this block of wood over. So uh, that's the bouncy one, right? So let's um, figure out the first, the height that we need the bouncy one to be at in order for it to knock this block of wood over. So let me just put this one to the side, the dead one, and I'll try some various heights until it's sufficient to block, knock this down. Let's try 30 centimeters above the table. Nope, it does not work. Let's try 40, almost, maybe 45. All right, 45 was enough. So 45 centimeters, if you want to see that again. And you know what? To show that I'm not Yeah, lousy tape. Hopefully you could see this mark, the 45 centimeter mark, and it will be sufficient to knock the block of wood over. Now let's switch for the one that has no bounce to it. All right, so again, here it is, the dead one, right? doesn't bounce. Let's get it lined up. So let's try the same height, 45 centimeters. See, you should be able to see that tape. Does not do it. Now let's try a little higher, like 50 maybe. You see, it's higher than the tape. Still not enough. Let's try 55. Still not enough. 60. Oops, there it was. 60 centimeters instead of 45. This needed more velocity to knock it down. The bounce was more effective at creating an impulse on the block to knock it down. Why is that the case? Well, let me get this out of the way. So let's suppose we have no bounce. So the ball comes in, hits a target, and let's suppose it comes in, and I'll just make up a no number, um, P initial equals 10. Forget about the units, let's just keep it as simple as possible. And then it hits, P final, no bounce is zero. The delta P in this case is final minus initial or negative 10. Let's see what happens with the bounce. It 
And let's suppose it comes in with PI equals 10 again. And now it bounces back and nothing bounces back perfect. Let's say it bounces back at 8. But here's the thing. Momentum and velocity, all these things are vectors. And I have not yet put the information of the backwards direction in, but I must. So what I need for the backwards direction is not to call it 8, but negative 8. Now that indicates backwards 8. Let's do delta P here. Final minus the initial, which is positive 10, negative 18, okay? More impulse with a bounce because of the extra negative momentum there. So interesting, the bouncing creates more impulse. So uh, uh, one application of this uh, in the old days, you know, when they were, um, oh, let me uh, give you a chance to jot this down. So in the old days, before there was electricity, people did things with water and mills. So the standard paddle, paddle wheel just had wood like this, and then the water went from P initial, maybe 10, let's say 10, to P final equals zero. So there was no bounce to the water, just hit the thing and stopped. There was a, uh, a man named Pendleton who knew his physics and he made the blades curve like this. And then what happened is when the water went down with P initial equals 10 and maybe bounced up with P final, negative eight, there was more delta P to the water and therefore more impulse to the wheel. And that meant more logs cut in a certain amount of time more grain ground, whatever the mill did, it was able to do more of it. And Pendleton, from this patent, made a fortune back in the day. All right, so that's it for today. Remember, we're learning a new topic, momentum, completely redundant. Newton's laws gives us all the information, but with a lot more intense calculations. So this is all just redundant material but it allows us to analyze impacts, crashes, with less effort, like the jar hitting the floor, like a car hitting a brick wall versus a hay bale or crumple zones. This idea of an inverse proportionality, more time is like a cushion, meaning less force, for the same impulse, J, change in momentum. When you hit something that doesn't give, there's less time of impact, more force. And that's the same delta P, but in a different manner with force and time. That's what we learned today, just the concepts behind impulse, force, time, momentum. In the next video, we're gonna now move on to calculations and analyzing things numerically and getting answers. But I hope you enjoyed all the demonstrations all the new interesting ideas. I'll see you in the next physics video.